Well, good morning. It is always good to see everybody here. And just, just a reminder, since this is still new, if you are here with us or watching with us online, uh, send an email or a text with your first and last name and who's here to hear at waterview.org, just so we have a record of everybody and can make sure we're looking after everybody as best as we can. There it is, here at waterview.org. Text or email, either one works well. <clears throat> The next song that we're going to sing is one of my very favorites. It's fairly new to us all. Um, I probably sing it on the way to church almost every single week, if not more frequently than that. Um, but I like it because it, it speaks to the salvation that God offers to us and his, his strength to overcome so many things that stand in the way that would be obstacles for us, but not for him. Uh, and I want to invite you to stand as we sing this song. Hear the holy roar of God resound, hear the holy roar of God resound. And watch the waters part before us now, watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us, tell the world of his great love. Our God is a God who saves, our God is a God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for all the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. We thank you for allowing us to come here and to worship freely. We pray that we clear our minds and our hearts so that we can focus on you. We pray that we just fix our hearts on your word so we can be a light to this world. May everything that is done and said here today, give you all the glory that you deserve. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
We come before you to worship you and to exalt your name because you are only worthy, Father. Thank you for the opportunity we have to remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. As we take this piece of bread, help us remind us that it is only possible because sacrifice, sacrifice of your son. We ask your blessing on each of us as we partake of this bread, and we ask your blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, as we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus on our behalf, we celebrate fellowship with you. We thank you at the table. Also, sit with others, and we remember that this fellowship is only possible through sacrifice. Now that we partake of, of the cup, we ask that you bless the fruit of the vine, and bless, bless your church, Father, as we, as we remember the sacrifice and the blood shed for our sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, in this moment we remember the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that we by his poverty might become rich. And we are thankful for your blessings. We are thankful for your mercy. And we ask your blessing. Uh, going to contribute, Father, that you may bless and that you may multiply our efforts uh, to reach out those that do not know you, Father. Uh, bless, bless our contribution and bless each family represented here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you, let's be standing for this song. In heavenly armor will enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory. We are slowly but surely moving toward normalcy. About the most normal thing I do every week is come here and worship with you. And I'm starting to notice that more and more people are feeling more and more comfortable coming back. And so we're going to feel more and more normal as we go along in this process. Hang in there. We're going to get there. And I'm just so glad that you're, you can be here with us today. Today we are going to continue, you probably heard me say a few weeks ago that around 150 times or so, the Bible mentions the word hope, depending on the translation that you use. And so uh, there are a lot of passages, a lot of text about hope, but I want to do something today though that, that really doesn't have anything to do with a passage or a verse about hope, but there is a connection to hope. Something that you do every day I hope you do every day, illustrates the sin, and I hope in my God. That's what you do when you pray. So I would remind you then that prayer really is rooted in hope. Therefore, we shouldn't be surprised when we open up the Word of God and we see passages where the concept, the Word itself might not be mentioned, but the concept itself regarding hope and prayer are connected. I want to show you a couple of examples of that. If you have a Bible, go back to a familiar psalm, Psalm chapter 3. You know these words, you've read them many times. Psalm chapter 3, there's a note there before the text that says this is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. And this is what David said. You might even say this is what David prayed. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, 
There is no salvation for him in God. The word salvation there is a word that could be translated differently with different words. It, it might mean deliverance. It might mean help. I would suggest to you it might even mean hope. There is no hope for him, the enemies might say. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Notice what he says. Verse 4, he says, I cry, cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. David said, I have prayed to God about this. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me. Now let me ask you this question. How do you know that David was answered in this prayer by God? How did God answer this prayer? How did David know God answered this prayer? That's one of our dilemmas about prayer. A lot of times we pray, and we wondered, well, it... Is God going to answer this prayer? I would suggest to you God answers prayer. You know that he always answers prayer, but he doesn't always answer it the way that we want. Sometimes we don't even know exactly how he is answering that prayer because the answer might be, I hear you, but let's wait and see. But how do we know that the Lord answered David on this occasion? I think you might say that he knew in one sense that literally the Lord helped him because he kept finding safety along the way. David was a man who encountered death so many times, and yet God protected him. And so in that way, David would say, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. But in another sense, I would suggest to you that he answered him in the hope of prayer itself. God answered him in the hope of prayer. You see, to literally be able to call out to the one who holds this world in his hand, to make petitions known to him, I think is possibly one of the most overlooked aspects and comforts of prayer itself. You see, in prayer, we trust so much in God that we, like David, can say, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. He said that in Psalm chapter 18 and verse 3, and it's a song that we sometimes sing. So what I'm trying to say to you is this. When you pray, when Christians are rooted in God, now not only does, do you see that connection from the Old Testament passage here, Psalm 3, there are probably other places in the Old Testament, but I'd like to show you one example of this also in the New Testament where the connection is made between prayer and hope. The Lord himself in the New Testament connects this idea of prayer and hope. You may recall a parable that, that he taught on one occasion in Luke chapter 18. It's the parable uh, of, um, it's the parable of the, the persistent widow. And in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, the scripture says, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. The New Century Version here says that Jesus taught his followers that they should always pray and never lose hope. I think that's what Jesus is teaching in this parable. But the greatest evidence of all, I think, that prayer and hope are intricately connected is in one of the most common passages about prayer in the New Testament. One that you probably almost know by heart. And it is in Matthew chapter 6, that passage we call the Lord's Prayer. I want you to turn over with me to Matthew chapter 6. And I want us today to see that there really is hope in the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, we read what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. I want you to take the time to read with me. It's on the screen. Read with me what the Lord himself said in what we call the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer. Let's read together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the international, or rather the, uh, the uh, English Standard Version on the Lord's Prayer. I'll comment just a little bit more later in our lesson 
about how there is a slight difference in the verse, the last verse there. And so in the Lord's Prayer, the most famous sermon of all, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us what he calls the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you'll notice up before, we, we just read beginning in verse 9, but notice the context because it's in the Lord's Prayer, rather in the Sermon on the Mount, that the Lord begins to teach about prayer and it overflows in then to what we know as the Lord's Prayer. But up in verse 5, he begins by teaching about prayer when he says, and when you pray. And so the, the assumption is you're going to pray. This is something you're going to do. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they stand, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, he says, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they, they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. I hope you notice the, the statement there in verse 9 where Jesus then goes on to say, pray then like this. But also pay attention to the statement that precedes that, verse 8, where he says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Some have asked a question based on that statement like this. If God knows what we need oh, and ask him, then why pray in the first place? Why should we pray if God already knows what is on our heart? Well, I think the answer to that question might just be this. Prayer is not so much us talking to God, but us talking to ourselves about God. When we pray, we're really talking to God, we know, but we're really also talking to ourselves about God. Because as we see in the Lord's Prayer, we're reminded about why we pray. And we're reminded about why we can have hope in prayer. And so instead of calling this the model prayer, it might be better to call this the motivational prayer because it focuses our attention on why we pray. It focuses our attention on why we have hope in prayer. And so that's what I want to concentrate on in the next few minutes with you. What follows this statement, the Lord knows what you need before you ask. And then the Lord saying, pray like this. He might even could have said, pray because of this. What follows, I think, what we know to be the Lord's Prayer is seven statements about why there's hope in prayer. Very simple stuff. Just follow along as we go along. First of all, there is hope in prayer because our God is our Father in heaven. There's hope in prayer because our God is the Father in heaven. That's how Jesus began this prayer, our Father in heaven. When we pray, we are speaking to the one. And the only Have you talked to anyone powerful lately? Normally when that happens, we'd like to go tell others, you know, that's who I got to talk to. I want to suggest to you, if you've prayed today, you've talked to someone powerful, significant. You've talked to someone famous today because you have prayed to the Father, your Father. Prayer is a vocalization that we believe that God's our creator and that we believe that he is in control and we also believe that he is conscious. He is our conscious God who's conscious of us. You see, there is a, an element of theology deism that suggests that God is real, God made the world, but that God's really off doing his own thing and he's not really paying attention to what's here. He's not mindful of us. Therefore, obviously, if you pray to him, he could care less because he's not paying attention. That's what deism suggests. But what the Bible suggests, what the Lord's Prayer suggests, 
is that we, when we pray, we are speaking to the God who's conscious of us, our Father who is in heaven. That is a statement of hope. Number two, there is also hope in prayer because God's name is hallowed. He goes on to say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we call on God in prayer, that is unlike any other name. To be hallowed means to be set apart. It means to be holy. But in this prayer, it is also the reminder that God's not common. You, you know, there, there are so many things that are common to us. Things that we do every day, words that we say every day. But the point is, God's name being hollow, hallowed means that this is not a common name. It's not common. It is different. God's name is different. God's name is powerful. It means so much to us. In the Bible, God is Elohim. He is your creator. God is Jehovah Jireh. He is the one, the Lord, the God who will provide. He is Jehovah Shalom. He's the God of peace. He is El Elyon. He is the God who is sovereign or in control. He is El Roy. He is the God who sees. But you also know that in the Bible, He is Abba. He is Abba Father. He is your personal, He is your, on your level, relation as Father. That's who Abba Father is. God as Father is a name that generates hope. The Bible actually says in Psalm 52 and verse 9, In your name I will hope, for your name is good. There is hope in prayer because God's name is hallowed. Number three, there is hope in prayer also because God has the power to rule. And I'd like to suggest, He not only has the power to rule, but He has the power to rule even in you. He rules personally in us when we allow Him to do that. Jesus continued in the prayer by saying, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's rule is not just for heaven. God's rule is for earth. God's rule is not for others. God's rule is for me. When we pray, we acknowledge that God has the power to establish His rule everywhere. Not just in heaven, but also here on earth. And when we pray, we are acknowledging that God's government, God's rule should be the most dominant rule in my life. Whatever concern we have for politics, our number one concern should be that God's rule, God's government, rules my heart. It is then our opportunity, it's our call really for action to allow God to rule in me. If God's will is to be done on earth, it is going to be done because of me. It's going to be done because of us, because we embrace that call to action. It's our purpose for God's will, for God's rule to happen in my life. If you are looking for purpose in your life, God says, I want my rule to be your rule. I want to rule in you. And so this is why we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew 6 and verse 33. Perhaps you've heard someone say, well, we shouldn't pray this prayer like this. We shouldn't pray for the kingdom to come because they might say, because the kingdom has already come. And, and if someone said that, they probably meant that Jesus spoke these words before the church was established. And, and now they mean, um, now they should reflect how we understand the church has been established. The church has come. So, so someone would say, well, maybe we shouldn't pray these words in this regard. But I want to encourage you to realize something. Jesus, when he prayed these words, I don't think he was talking necessarily about something that was to come. Now, now maybe there's a, a point of reference there that I think we could make. But I'd encourage us to realize that when Jesus spoke these words, he wasn't really trying to make a point about theology. He, he wasn't really trying to make a point about uh, ecclesiology, the, the study of the church. I don't think that was his point. I don't think he was necessarily saying, now, 
pray like this, your kingdom come, and then for those who would read this after the establishment of the church, for them to say, but now the kingdom has come. I don't think that was the point necessarily that Jesus was making. Yes, there is the sense that the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. But what I really think the Lord is talking about here is ruling in me. And you know what? That is something I need to pray every day. Your kingdom come. I need to pray that every day, that God's rule, that God's kingdom will rule my heart. And that, is, that gives me great hope. It gives me great purpose for God to rule in me. Number four, there is also hope in prayer because God promises daily help. He goes on to say in this prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Of course, all of us understand that that would be literally in reference to something to eat. We, we believe that this is something we should do every day. We drink, we eat every day. But it's not necessarily about food so much as it is about recognizing the one who has the power to give it to us. I'd like to remind you that God is the God of yesterday, but God is also the God of today, and God is the God of tomorrow. Prayer, then, is a reminder to take on life one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's how we need to live our lives for the Lord, one day at a time. And just as God will not place more trouble on you than you can bear, He also promises His care will be sufficient for the trouble for each day. I think that's what Matthew chapter 6, verse 34 really teaches. And if you're wondering how God feels about you, if you're wondering if God truly cares for you, if you're, if you're wondering if you pray to Him for your personal daily needs, if He hears you and if He will respond to you, not only do you have that prayer, Matthew 6 and verse 33, we'll seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added to you. But in Matthew chapter 7, I'd like to remind you, beginning in verse 9, what the Lord says about this. He says, which of you, if his son asks him for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask of him? When we pray, there is hope because we're reminded that God promises daily help. Number five. There is also hope in prayer because God wins our biggest battle. Jesus said, pray, forgive us of our debts. Forgive us of our debts. In prayer, we can confess that we are sinners. But more importantly, we are calling out to a God who saves us from our sins. Part of the rule of God in the world is God sending His Son, God sending His King to us. But not only did the King come to rule, He also came to redeem. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Remember in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul makes a pretty famous statement when he says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Well, what is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, Paul? Paul said to Timothy, this is what's trustworthy. This is what's deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And there Paul said, of whom I am foremost... Maybe your translation says, I am chief, chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. Paul said this is a trustworthy statement. This is a statement deserving of full acceptance. Some of the translations say this is a faithful saying. Five times Paul tells Timothy that. Somewhere in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy or, or Titus. And and, and just about in all of those, except for one instance, in just about all of those, you know what he's doing when he's saying this is a trustworthy statement, this is a faithful statement, this is worthy of full acceptance? In every one of those texts, I've looked at all of them except that one, he is talking about how God intervened 
in human affairs to save sinners in every context. And so what, what this statement may refer to when he says this is a trustworthy statement, this is worthy of full acceptance, he may be actually referring to how there was a time where people didn't have the gospel accounts. The church was established in many locations before people got what we know to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so the gospel more than likely came to those people by word of mouth. And one of the things that was faithful, one of the things that was trustworthy, one of the things that was worth He says, for if we forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if, if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will the Father forgive your trespasses. So he makes it pretty clear. If you pray to God and say, God, forgive me, forgive me of my, my sins, that's good, but unless you're willing to forgive others of their sins, the sins that they've committed against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Very straightforward, very, very plain. That's Jesus' inspired commentary on what that means. But I also hope that you'll remember that in this prayer, we are praying to a God who has done that very thing. He is, we are praying to a God who is willing to forgive. His very Son calls attention to what happened at Calvary. I'm sure maybe as a, a cross-reference to this statement of forgive us of our debts. When you recall Jesus, while He was hanging on the cross, He prayed to God and He said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they do. Jesus said, God is a God who will forgive people. And so we call upon God to not only forgive us, but we find ourselves being taught about how in that forgiveness, we have to turn around and forgive others. And when Jesus prayed, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us, I think what he's really saying is, Lean on your God. Learn from your God. Know His character. Trust His character. Know that He was willing to do this for you and know that you can do that for others. This is a statement of hope. If you're finding it difficult to do dif difficult things in relation to your Christianity, remember that God did the most difficult thing of all. And that is while you were in your sins, He sent Christ Jesus for your forgiveness to redeem you and now he says, as I have forgiven you, go out and forgive others. And so this is a statement of hope that you can do one of the most difficult things in the world. You can forgive someone who has sinned against you. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's just not a statement to be thrown around to me that you can you know, score 30 points in your next ball game necessarily. But when it comes to doing the things that God tells us to do, it applies. And if it's a difficult thing for you to forgive someone, you can look to God and you can see that example. You can look to this prayer and you can get that hope. God will assist us to do difficult things. That is a statement of hope. Finally, number seven. There is hope in prayer. Because God is in control to the very end. Verse 13, the last statement of this prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but del deliver us from evil. You may have a translation that goes on to say, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And if you wonder why, like we read from earlier, the ESV, compared to a statement like um, a translation like maybe the King James or the New King James, if you wonder why there's a difference there, it has to do with... Um, Variants in the manuscripts. Some of the translations, some of the ancient manuscripts contain that last statement. Some of them don't. And it's believed that the very best ones don't contain it. But, what I'm, but I'm just pointing that out, not to make a, a point about that, but just to say there are manuscripts, though, that go on to say, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, here's what I'd have to say about that. Whether it's in the translation you're using or not, 
The concept's true. The concept really is true. God is a God who has the kingdom and a God who has the power and a God who is going to bring that to completion. At the beginning of this prayer, in the middle of this prayer, and at the end of this prayer, there is a strong statement being made about the God who is in heaven, the God who is ruling on earth, and the God who will see the story to completion. That is a statement about hope. There is hope in prayer because God is in control to the end. I want to ask you as we close our lesson today, do you believe what this prayer says? Do you believe the words of this prayer? Now, now we, we say we believe in prayer, and, and we do, but remember why we believe in prayer. We believe in prayer because we believe in God. And so do you believe that this is true for you? When you say these words, if you read these words again as we did earlier, are they really true about your life? That is the challenge I would leave with you today to make what we've said today about the hope that we find in the Lord's Prayer true of all of our lives. And so I'll ask you this as we close before we sing this song. Is God your Father? Have you honored His name? Has His rule come into your life? Do you trust Him on a daily basis? Is He really your Savior? Has He forgiven you of your sins? And are you then allowing Him to help you do difficult things and ultimately, have you cast your lot with the God who is in control, who's in heaven, who's in earth, and who's going to be there at the end? Have you cast your lot with the God who writes the end of the story? That is the God of hope that you can have if you will open up your life and give your life to Him. And if you need to do that, Two of our shepherds are in the back. You can walk to the front. We're going to stand, this, we're going to stand and sing this song to encourage us to think about what we've talked about today. Together as we stand and sing. Good morning. We want to welcome everybody here today, uh, everyone that's here and everyone who is watching at home. Jason, we want to thank you again for the wonderful lesson that you, you always bring us. You always seem to give us the, the portion of God's Word that we need at that particular moment. And you have really helped us through this pandemic and you have pointed us to the things that are important and we thank you so much for that. We know that everyone is aware that the COVID-19 infection is slowly decreasing and some experts think that we may actually be approaching herd immunity in the near future. But everyone still needs to be careful do what you know you're supposed to do, and everyone needs to get vaccinations as soon as it is available to you. So, in response to this slowly improving climate 
And to be proactive, the elders and deacons had a wonderful meeting last Sunday afternoon. We discussed the various aspects of reintroducing Bible classes and other congregational activities. And I can say that we're starting to get excited about that. We are going to slowly, slowly reintroduce various programs and they will be announced in the near future. So please read the Waterview newsletter for details. Everyone needs to continue to pray for our ill and those who are convalescing from illnesses. Some recent developments are that Mark Howe will have his cancer surgery tomorrow. Jan Nichols was in Richardson Methodist Hospital ICU with breathing issues because of COVID, but she is, has now been transferred to a rehab facility in Allen. Jim Kingsbury is undergoing cancer treatments and is responding very well to these treatments. And we just got word that Ben Cole had a light stroke and is at Medical City of Dallas Hospital, MCD, and, and he should be released soon. Would you please pray with me? Our Father, we thank you that, that this virus is starting to recede. We know, Father, as Jason has pointed out so well, that you are in control. And we pray that this viral threat will, will soon end. Help us, Father, as we start planning the, the reuniting of the congregation as well as a startup of various programs and activities. We pray, Father, that the, the hardships and the tremendous inconveniences of the past few months will not discourage us, Father, but rather will serve to unite us, to unite us even more in love and appreciation for each other and what we have. And especially, Father, we pray that it will give us more love and appreciation for you. And then, Father, help us to take then this, this feeling, this kinship feeling that we should have and, and direct this kinship feeling and this love, Father, to our fellow man by trying to expose your word to those who will listen. Our Father, we thank you for your blessings. We do not thank you enough. We realize that, Father. And it is amazing, Father, that even in hard and difficult times such as we've been going through, we see your blessings constantly. Our Father, we we pray that you will extend your healing hand and comforting hand to the Waterview Saints that need your help. We pray that you will give them what they need, Father. And we ask your blessings upon Mark Howell. And we ask, Father, that his surgery tomorrow will be successful. We ask that you will be with Jan Nichols as she recovers from COVID. And, and Father, please help Jim Kingsbury to continue responding well to his cancer treatments. And, and Father, of course, we ask your blessings also upon Ben Cole and Nola. We pray that you will help Ben to recover completely from his light stroke, and we pray that he will have no sequelae to that. Again, Father, Please be with each of us as we try to obey you. Help us, Father, to be serious about that and to give you our best efforts. We are truly comforted, Father, when we realize that living a life, a blessed life, under your care and under your, your umbrella of love makes the troubles of life seem trivial. 
And Father, we constantly praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand for the closing prayer? Don't you